I'm uh, delighted to be here today. Uh, I'm going to do two things today. I'm going to pick up on, I'm not going to talk about out of work, by the way, my book. Uh, is, I have a session on the Great Depression, which will draw heavily from that book, uh, which will be uh, one of the optional sessions tomorrow after today's lecture. I think most of you will decide to take the other uh, classes. But uh, the, uh, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to pick up on something that Professor Salerno talked about uh, yesterday. I, I attended his lecture and he was talking about uh, marginal, the, the use of marginal principles uh, uh, on the production side and on the consumption side of, for goods and services and uh, talking about marginal utility in law. And I want to use marginal con concepts in labor markets and show the, uh, the parallels and the connections and some of the interrelationships between uh, uh, labor markets on the one hand and goods markets on the other. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just uh, discuss uh, some of the principles uh, that uh, are elucidated by uh, Ludwig von Mises in Human Action dealing with labor. I, uh, just for uh, sake of argument uh, or a title, you can call it 10. Actually, we'll have 11 Miesian, uh, Misean commandments on labor. Uh, 11 commandments. I know the 10 commandments are somewhat out of fashion these days, uh, but still the uh, title 10 commandments sometimes uh, raises uh, uh, some uh, uh, eyebrows and people get excited. Uh, Bill Clinton, in his closing days of the administration, I understand, issued an executive order that, which was kept secret, amending one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, <laughs> something went something like, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife unless you're unusually horny and she is a hot babe. <laughs> Uh, I shouldn't have said that, but I just couldn't. <laughs> couldn't resist. Okay. Let us, I have uh, two handouts here, uh, which uh, were done in West Virginia PowerPoint. Uh, 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 the first one is the table, and let's go to it first. We've got to get down to business here. We only have 60 minutes. Uh, the... Uh, let's take a business enterprise that's making decisions about labor, about how many workers to hire, and, and by inference, making decisions about how many workers to hire is also getting involved in output decisions, since workers obviously are producing output. And some of the nuances of this discussion, we, we simply don't have time to talk about here, and I uh, wish we did, but so let's just put it at the simplest level. Let's say uh, this firm is making baskets, wicker baskets for sale. Uh, we actually have a firm in Ohio, a fast-growing firm that makes baskets for sale. They, oh, that's the high-tech industry in Ohio, making wicker baskets. Uh, and uh, let's say that the, the firm is considering hiring one worker, two workers, three workers, four workers, or five. This indicates the number of baskets per day that the firm uh, can make. Uh, 10 if you hire one, 19 if you hire two. You will note that as the number of workers rises, output rises by diminishing amounts. My example assumes a diminishing marginal productivity in a physical sense. Physical product of labor declines. You've got fixed quantity of, of capital inputs. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, so as you add more and more labor to those fixed quantities, the law of diminishing returns uh, physical returns is at, at work. Well, also for the sake of this example, and I struck, debated whether to do this or not, whether this overly complicates things, I assume the firm, in order to sell more baskets, will have to it's, uh, reduce the price somewhat in order to sell more. This actually goes back to what uh, Salerno was talking about, diminishing margin utility. It all works into that, but I, I can't repeat everything he said, but... It's essentially a downward sloping demand curve in conventional economics. Uh, and uh, you will note the total revenue of the firm associated with different numbers of workers. Uh, for one worker is producing 10 baskets at $20 a piece. 10 times 20 is 200. Uh, the, T, the column called TR is essentially this column two multiplied by column three. And this will get, indicate the revenue that the firm receives with different numbers of workers. Um, let us now um, uh, 
uh, note the marginal contribution of each worker to the firm's uh, revenue stream, uh, what I call their MP sub L, sometimes called the marginal product of a revenue product or sometimes uh, in a purely competitive model, the neoclassical model, they sometimes talk about the value of the marginal product, the MP. But what I call MP sub L there, it's the incremental or additional revenue associated with one more worker. It declines as the number of workers declines, partly because physical output is getting smaller per worker, partly because of the decline in prices associated uh, needed uh, uh, in order to sell all of the output. Uh, this, you know, there's uh, information uh, problems. There's a discovery process that goes on here. The discovery process, which happens in product markets, goes on in labor markets. I wish we could talk about all that, but in 60 minutes, I've got to limit what I can say. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll just let it go at that. So the firm uh, has a certain product of labor. Now, you might say right away, well, when you're hiring workers, just to give you some, a little bit of the nuances of some of, this, some of the problems, when you go out and hire a worker, do you really know how much output you're going to get from that worker? Can you say with any degree of certainty? Workers are not homogeneous. They're different. They differ in quality and, and, and in, uh, in uh, personal attributes. Uh, it isn't quite the same thing hiring workers as it is uh, hiring uh, uh, buy, buying standardized machines where, where each machine is one in the same. So there are some difficulties. I guess the best way to put this is, is the expected. Do you even know what price you're going to get for the good? Do you know what your, dem quote, demand curve looks like? Well, neoclassical economics sort of blithely assumes you know all of this and that there's no, uh, you know, active discovery in finding this out. Austrian economics is more sophisticated and I think realistic in this. But for the moment, we're going to just assume uh, sort of that this knowledge is known or the, let's think of this as the, pers the expected price that, w uh, that will be needed to uh, sell the output, the expected output that the worker will produce. These are sort of the expectations of the entrepreneur. And so we can calculate the marginal product of labor and you notice it, uh, uh, the marginal uh, uh, revenue product of labor and you notice it declines as uh, output expands. Now let's say workers are paid uh, a wage of a, around $100 a day that in order uh, to induce more, you can find a worker who will work for a do 100 bucks, uh, but uh, you want to get a second worker, he, he's not quite sure he'll work for 100 so you offer him a little more. I just made it 101 here to keep it simple. A uh, slightly uh, 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 positively sloped supply curve for labor implied by this uh, example. And the next column indicates the total labor cost, which is simply... Uh, found by multiplying the number of workers times the wage. You can then calculate the marginal cost or the incremental cost associated with hiring more workers, which is the last column, uh, 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 which uh, ranges in this example from 100 to 108 dollars uh, in the range of one to five. Now, how many workers will this business hire? How many workers will the firm uh, uh, take on? That's the critical uh, uh, factor here is the relationship between the marginal uh, revenue product labor, the, or the MP sub L here uh, uh, column, and the wage column, uh, or, or, or rather uh, between the marginal uh, uh, between the marginal cost of labor, the, the last column, and the marginal revenue associated uh, with a worker, which is that MP sub L column. And you will note that if you hire three worker, the first worker adds $200 of output to the firm, uh, costs $100, so clearly you want to hire that worker. Should I hire another worker? Well, my perception is, my perception is, is the second worker will add another $161 of revenue to the firm, and I can hire uh, that second worker for $102. I actually can pay him $101, but I'm going to have to work offer the state, we're assuming here homogeneous labor for the sake of this argument in the real, real world, you, that example would be more complicated than this. So we, we will hire the second worker. The third worker uh, adds $125 to the firm. Uh, revenue stream uh, costs 104 bucks. Uh, we'll add the third worker. Should we hire the fourth worker? The fourth worker is going to add another, we perceive, we believe, based on what we know about the workers and about our product and all, we believe 
that the fourth worker will add about $82 of additional revenue, but will cost about $106. Hiring the fourth worker will lower uh, our profits, will be uh, a uh, worsen our financial condition, so we'll stop hiring at th- after three. We will stop, we will add workers up to the point where the marginal revenue product of labor uh, is uh, equal uh, to the, the, uh, the, the wage costs, uh, incremental wage costs associated with hiring labor. So the marginal product of labor is the determinant of wages. Now, let's suppose that this product, these baskets, I don't know what baskets, you know, why people buy baskets anyway. They buy baskets to carry things in. But people use them for decorations and so forth. And let's say that uh, someone who's a cultural icon was seen carrying one of these baskets around. Or, uh, I don't know, dare I say Hillary Clinton? No, I don't. Uh, Britney Spears. One of those people, Britney Spears, Hillary Clinton, someone of that nature. Uh, 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 so it, it's in the magazines. Here's Britney Spears carrying these baskets. And all, every young woman says, oh, I've got to have one of those. It's so cool. So, so what happens is the demand for baskets goes up. At any given price of baskets, more people want to buy baskets than before. People's subjective... Uh, values uh, have changed. Preferences have changed. The marginal utility of owning a basket at any given uh, 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 number of baskets for an any for for a large number of individuals has risen because Britney Spears uses the basket. And for some strange reason, people utility goes up because Britney Spears likes this basket. Okay, that's just life. That's human action. So human action works in this direction. What does that say about labor markets? In other words, what goes on in product markets doesn't impact labor markets. The answer is yes. And and what it means is the firms in in the basket industry will end up hiring more workers. Employment will rise in the basket industry. Moreover, wages will rise in the uh, basket industry and more money will be paid to workers. So the little old basket maker is going to bask in uh, greater income as a consequence of Britney Spears' uh, utility, such as life. Uh, and, uh, and here, let's assume just, and I won't go through all the numbers again because of time consideration, let's assume uh, the price of baskets at any output level indicated in this chart rises by $5.00. Uh, and I went through, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, I calculated what the total revenue would be uh, for uh, each uh, worker and what the marginal product of labor expressed in dollars, marginal revenue product of labor would be. And uh, uh, again, the marginal cost of labor column has remained unchanged. It turns out hiring the fourth worker is a good idea. The fourth worker adds $127 to the firm's uh, output. Again, this is what is perceived is going to happen if you hire the fourth worker. The fourth worker might be an alcoholic, uh, uh, be a crummy basket maker, uh, and not work out as you anticipated. And in our simple example here, we are ignoring that. But in the real world, uh, and this is you know, very much an Austrian idea, there's entrepre- you know uh, uh, very much... Uh, uh, a, uh, a discovery process here. It's not a mechanistic world where everyone knows everything, knows exactly what your demand curve looks like, knows exactly what your labor uh, uh, personal attributes are and so forth. Uh, that's why we test uh, workers to find out, uh, you know, give them, ask them questions and all. And, and the courts now, of course, don't let us do this very much anymore. But that's part of the process we t- try to uh, find out what workers can do. But based on uh, uh, the, our, our perceived knowledge, the fourth worker is going to add us $127 to the firm's output. It's only going to cost us 106 and it is profitable to hire the fourth worker. So what happened in, in, the, in the goods market? A sudden passion for baskets, increased interest in baskets, will lead to greater employment in the, in the labor market. 
and they actually lead to a little higher wage, a little more money being paid to uh, workers and so forth. And the graph at the bottom of the page uh, done in West Virginia PowerPoint shows that as the demand, using this conventional demand supply curve uh, techniques that uh, many people like, uh, using downward sloping demand, upward sloping supply curves for baskets on the left, the demand for basket rises at any given price, more baskets are demanded, uh, quantity demanded has risen, so the price of baskets goes up, the number of baskets sold goes up, more workers get ho hired, it manifests itself in the labor market in an increase in the demand for labor. Demand for labor is determined by marginal revenue product of labor. That, uh, uh, that marginal product of labor goes up because you're getting five bucks more for each basket that each worker makes. And so each worker is adding more dollars to the firm. So at any given wage, the quantity of labor demanded has risen. That leads to a higher rate of wages, more employed. So... What happens in, in product markets impact on what happens in labor markets? Now, if you were a Keynesian, uh, I guess I don't even need to finish the sentence, do I? Uh, but a Keynesian looking at this would say and did say for 100 years or 70 years, 1936 till still saying. Still, Alan Blinder, who's the uh, Keynesian de jure, I don't know. Uh, whoever the, you know, Clinton's counsel, Joe Stiglitz. I'll use Joe Stiglitz. Joe Stiglitz would say, well, what we can do, you know, to stimulate employment is we can move those prices of baskets up and the pri prices of everything up by dropping money out of airplanes or printing dollars or using an expansionary monetary policy. And so we can have a general increase in prices, what we call inflation. And if we do that, we uh, instead of the price of just baskets going up, let's say the price of everything goes up. My original example, price of basket went up because of, of a change in human action, taste. But now let's say the prices go up because of of, of, of an inflationary monetary policy of the government. It would seem, and this is what Keynes told us for 65 years. I'm getting to the Phillips curve. That's where we're going. Uh, but we're not going to stay there long because it's wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we ought to at least mention it in passing. Uh, what, 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 what happens with inflation is inflation increases the dollar value of the output of each incremental worker. The dollar margin, MRP, has risen. And so at any given wage, we will want to hire more workers because it's more profitable to do so. So a Keynesian would say, if you have inflation, you will increase employment and reduce unemployment. We're going to come back to unemployment in a, in a little bit when we get to our 11 commandments. But that's what the Keynesian said. And so if the rate of price inflation rises because the price of baskets going up, the price of milk has gone up, the price of Diet Coke has gone up, price of everything's going up practically. Uh, uh, and and the, the, the Keynesian would say this would lead to higher employment, uh, lo which means lower unemployment. And we get going to the second piece of paper uh, at the top, something which was called the Phillips curve, named after an Australian... A.W. turned Englishman, uh, A.W. Phillips, uh, who was an engineer, by the way, uh, by training, and this is very engineering-like in its application. And so when I started teaching in the 60s, before I knew even how to spell Mises' name, I got up and drew on the board. I'm sorry I did this. I was wrong. I sinned. I, I, I told my te uh, students lies. Uh, <laughs> My only defense is I don't do it anymore, and most of my colleagues still do. I drew the Phillips curve and said, you know, oh, I got cute with it. If you're a Republican, you operate here. If you're a Democrat, you operate. Your Lyndon Johnson operates up here, and you know, Barry Goldwater would be down here, and all this cute stuff. Well, the problem with the Phillips curve, of course, what's wrong with this? Well, it sort of assumes 
that if we have inflation, that workers who are engaging in human action sort of sit there dumbly and say, duh, I'm not getting, uh, I'm having to pay 50% more than I did last year for my Coca-Cola. And I'm paying 25% more for my beer. And uh, uh, Joe Sixpack, you know, is fighting the price of six packs going up. But I still will work for $100. Haven't changed it all there. Gee, I don't know what I can do about that. <laughs> the reality is the labor, just as demand rises for labor in a nominal sense and using nominal of uh, values because of the higher nominal marginal revenue product of labor. Nominal, not real. Nothing real has changed. Basket makers aren't making any more baskets. So as demand rises, the Keynesians would have led us to believe uh, the graph, the second graph down on the second sheet, the demand for, uh, on the left side, the demand will go from D1 to D2 as the Fed prints more money uh, it will cross the labor supply curve at a, uh, a higher level employment, meaning a lower level unemployment. But what, what it ignores, of course, what this ignores is human action in the form of workers responding to inflation uh, and saying, I am not going to work at that same wage, or at least not as much. Maybe I'll work fewer hours. Maybe I won't work at all. Maybe if it's my wife, I work and my wife works, my wife will say, hell with it. I'm quitting. Uh, you know, I'm going to go watch Oprah. <laughs> uh, because it, the real wage has declined. So uh, the, these wages are expressed in money terms. So as money wage, so real wages fall. So people respond to that by reducing their labor supply. The labor supply curve shifts, shifts from uh, the original labor supply curve F, S1 to a new labor supply curve S2 crosses the new demand curve at uh, D2 at a, at a point which indicates a higher money wage being paid, but no increase in employment. And so you have no, uh, uh, no the, the active inflation creates no new jobs. Uh, later on, uh, Friedman and others uh, 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 put this in the context of something called the natural rate of unemployment, which says that, in effect, there's no relationship between inflation and employment or inflation and unemployment in the long run. And, uh, but Austrian economists are uncomfortable with the very word unemployment. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But I'm just uh, going through a little of this uh, productivity theory. Incidentally, as uh, Salerno, uh, Professor Salerno mentioned, um, uh, this all goes back, in a sense, to Menger. It all goes back to Menger in the original Bomberic and but particularly the American uh, 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 pre-Austrian or the American, uh, Joe referred to him as Mingarian, uh, uh, J.B. Clark is a guy who developed a, a this a lot explicitly uh, in the early days. Uh, now, what happens if, however, the productivity of labor, the marginal product of labor rises because of capital formation? What if the marginal product of labor rises because something real has happened? Production techniques have gotten better. What happens if the marginal pro people are making more baskets because they can use machines now to do some of the, the work on the baskets that make allow just as good of a product but using fewer uh, hours of labor input so an individual basket maker can make more baskets? That is uh, increases the demand for labor uh, for uh, baskets because the marginal product of labor is rising. So the demand curve shifts to the right. Uh, that leads to higher wages and higher employment and higher output. That technological progress and capital formation leads to a higher standard of living. So the most important thing in the long run in labor markets is that the standard of living goes up because of capital formation and technological progress and the removal of impediments to productivity rising, including government regulations and uh, so forth. So uh, where you s why are Americans today producing 25 times more output uh, per person than they were at, in the colonial era uh, per person? Uh, it's because of this massive uh, increase 
uh, in a capital formation. So uh, what happens in capital markets and what happens in the forming of capital is vitally important in the long run in labor markets as well. In institutional restrictions on the formation of capital, uh, such as hoods, uh, uh, such as governments confiscating people's wealth, expropriating people's wealth, high taxes, all of these things that governments do to impede capital formation have a detrimental impact uh, on uh, the, uh, the rise in real wages over time. What about minimum wages in terms of our little analysis? We are having a discussion in Washington, uh, the, uh, uh, the unprincipled members of Congress, the, uh, most of them, all of them are unprincipled, most of them, all of them are unprincipled. <laughs> We, we were debating about Ron Paul just a minute ago. I mean, at least 534 out of 535 are unprincipled. I know, I work for the gang of 535. Uh, uh, and those of you from the EU, it's even worse in Europe. Uh, at, at least we have a Congress we could go to. In Brussels, you go to God only knows. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we even know who the vil- we at least know who the villains are in our country, uh, but uh, uh, you have a minimum wage. You raise the minimum wage. In effect, you're raising the marginal cost of labor. Going back to our very first uh, 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 graph, let's say instead of a hundred dollar, we say that the minimum wage of a basket maker for a day is going to be one fifty or something. Uh, uh, that will. Uh, lead to the marginal cost of labor rising. And so instead of hiring three, if it went to 150, we would end up hiring two workers in our little basket firm. And so uh, we, we would have reduced employment, higher unemployment, and we would have people thrown out of work uh, uh, because of essentially government policy. So uh, uh, you can, uh, using this kind of analysis, you can look uh, at at uh, a lot of things in labor. Uh, the last little graph at the bottom of the second page here, uh, you, I drew a conventional demand and supply curve. They intersect at a given point. Uh, again, uh, Austrians have some, there are some limitations with this conventional neoclassical way of looking at things, but it does, at least for pedagogical purposes, outline a place where you would have full employment uh, and if the government insists on a higher wage, you would have the quantity of labor supplied exceeding the quantity of labor demanded, and you would have, in fact, unemployment. And uh, that's what happens when minimum wages goes up. Incidentally, there are a couple economists around who are extremely well-known, named uh, David Card and Alan Kruger, who wrote a book a few years ago that came to the interesting conclusion that the minimum wage made no difference at all in employment or unemployment, in effect denied the existence of downward sloping demand curves for labor. And these p- people are still teaching. They have had salary increases since that book came out. Uh, uh, Card, I think, is at Berkeley. Uh, 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 Kruger is at, Cr- at Princeton. I think uh, uh, one of them won the uh, John Bates Clark Award from the American Economic Association for coming out with work which is just absurd. Uh, just absolutely absurd. So, uh, so much for mainstream economics. Let's move on to Mises. You can never, you never, when I was deciding what to say, I got about a hundred hours worth of material. Di Lorenzo is, wasn't here when I started and I told him, I'll go on an extra hour. I guess there's someone in, in between. I'll come back at three because I could go on forever on this stuff. But I had to pick and choose. And so I decided, well, what is better? What could, I, I couldn't do worse. I, and I could do, I, I mean, I couldn't do better uh, than t- to go to human action. And I picked out my 11 commandments. Uh, uh, not trying to outdo the Lord here, but when you're dealing with Mises, uh, there's an awful lot uh, that can be said. And so I'm going to give you 11 commandments. I just picked selected uh, passages uh, from uh, Human Action, uh, a chapter dealing with work and wages. Number And some of these I've already talked about in the context of this, and we'll go through quickly. Uh, uh, what time do we, we conclude at two, right? What time is it now? Uh, about 127. Oh, okay. I'm in good shape. 
that gives me 33 minutes, 11 commandments. It's uh, three minutes per commandment. Uh, Free MPC minutes per commandment. Uh, (laughs) Okay. Number one, and I'm quoting Mises. I'm actually reading from Mises here. The height of wage rates is determined on the market in the same way in which prices, in which the prices of all commodities are determined. The height of wage rates is determined on the market in the same way in which prices of all commodities are determined. Now, what is Mises getting at here? Labor is like other things in the sense that it's price, it's the value that people place on it, is determined uh, by the same sorts of marginal conditions, uh, revenue, uh, seeking revenue and so forth in case of firms, that it would be if if the firm was buying raw materials or and in the sense of the same way that people when they buy goods, uh, uh, their marginal utility is the the primary determinant uh, of uh, uh, ultimately of, of their demand and the price. It is the same kind of thing. I once was in a debate with Joseph Stiglitz, who, by the way, will win the Nobel Prize sometime in the next five years if he lives. I assume he will. Uh, uh, And he was the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under Clinton. And he was the World Bank guru for several years. Helped the world a lot, you know, through a lot of these crises. We all know how much we were helped. Uh, uh, Anyway, Joe Stiglitz and I were debating. Now, Stiglitz wrote a textbook a few years ago, best-selling textbook, which in it flatly said that minimum wages are awful. Flatly said it. And so we got in a debate on minimum wage. I was tweaking him. I was reading from his textbook, and he was squirming a little bit. And and then he said he had, you know, had an epiphany or a revelation since working for Clinton. Uh, And that somehow that, you know, the minimum wage laws really were pretty good after all. They really don't affect, un- they don't call much unemployment. And after all, you haven't read Card and Kruger, have you better? You know, in other words, who said that there's uh, demand curves are perfectly inelastic for labor. Uh, anyway, I won't bore you with all that. But anyway, one thing that Stiglitz said when I said minimum wages are bad, he said, workers aren't like potatoes. <laughs> And, and uh, workers are, 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 aren't commodities. They've got flesh and bones. So what? Does that change the basic behavior of businesses in making decisions? Whether you make the hiring a worker on the same basis you make hiring a machine. Now, labor is different in one respect. And this gets us to the second commandment. In, in the second commandment. Labor is very different in quality, and each kind of labor renders specific services. Labor is very different in quality, and each type kind of labor renders specific services. Now, this is a point that to most of us is rather obvious, but if you read a typical textbook, you don't often see this. We all have different attributes in life. We all have different talents. And just as we have different tastes and preferences in, in, in consumer markets, in labor markets, we have different talents. We have different abilities and skills. And thus, Oprah Winfrey apparently has enormous talents because she's paid extremely well. Because the marginal revenue product associated with Oprah's services is immense. People will pay zillions of dollars to get Oprah, millions of dollars to get her on TV. And, and people watch her show and with rap attention and buy books she recommends. And God only knows what else. Uh, I don't understand why they do it, but that's life. That's the glories of life. And this is an important point. Labor is not a homogeneous uh, 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 commodity. Uh, it, 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 it's different, and, and this makes labor markets more difficult in some ways to deal with because it isn't like you're buying a sack of potatoes or, or you're, 
you know, uh, or you're buying a ton of steel. A ton of steel is a ton of steel is a ton of steel, as Gertrude Stein might have said. Uh, she said a rose is a rose is a rose in one of her more lucid moments. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and because of that, the, the entrepreneur hiring labor has to deal with these, try to perceive these differences, find out what they are, uh, uh, and evaluate them. What does it mean in terms of output? What does it mean in terms of consumer acceptance of the product? And so forth. And so in making labor decisions, entrepreneurs sometimes make mistakes. We hire someone to be a basket maker who turns out to be an alcoholic and comes to work and uh, weaves the basket in the wrong way. Uh, or we hire Oprah and pay her $20 million a year and people are bored with her. And so, so therein lies the, the challenge to entrepreneurs. So, we're, so just as in, in product markets, uh, entrepreneurs are always working sort of in the direction of what neoclassical economists called equilibrium. What Mises, in, in order to, as, as Professor Hoppe said, in order you know, sometimes to, to help understand things, it's, it's a totally imaginary concept of the evening, evening uh, rotating economy. Uh, as we sort of work... Uh, in a, we, we, we don't have full knowledge of everything, but we're sort of working to this, what, what, what a standard economist would call equilibrium. We're, we're, we're often not entirely there. And this goes on in labor markets as well, uh, too. Point, what are we up to? Four? Oh, oh God, I better speed up. Uh, there prevails a continuous tendency for workers to shift from their branch to other similar occupations in which conditions seem to offer better opportunities. Thus, finally, every change in demand or supply in one sector affects all other sectors indirectly. Labor moves within limits. I mean, if you lose a job as a ditch digger, you don't pick up a newspaper and say, ah, oh, the local hospital needs a brain surgeon. I'm going to apply. <laughs> there are obviously limits. But people move to take advantages of shifting demand and supply. Uh, uh, is Professor Rako here? Good. Historians are... No one wants to hire historians these days. Uh, and I teach in a program with PhD students getting degrees in, in history. And they're making, you know, the, the, get a job at the College of Last Resort with a 24-hour teaching load making 28000 a year uh, and, uh, you know, you have to shovel snow in your free time. And, uh, and so some of these kids are 28-year-old, 30-year-old PhDs are coming to me and saying, gee, I can't get a job, or at least not one I want. I think I'll go get an MBA. <laughs> People shift to take advantages of differential salaries. Uh, of a, a, a new PhD in economics... Uh, at an American university will start at 70,000, one in history will start at 40. So some historians sort of are getting the light. Unfortunately, most historians don't understand the principle of scarcity, but nonetheless, they try to switch. And so we have a, a, some of that going on. Obviously, there are limits to it. It takes time to switch. It costs money to switch and so on. But it's, it's making a point. And this gets us the fourth point. Within certain limits, labor can be substituted for material Factors of production and vice versa. The extent that such substitutions are resorted to depends on the height of wage rates and the prices of material factors. Entrepreneurs look at prices of, 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 of different inputs into the production process. And if the price of labor soars, they, they seek substitutes using more machines, using raw, more, more raw materials. Or moving. Where's El Salvador? El Salvador, raise your hand. Uh, someone's here. They don't want to admit it. From El Salvador. Sweatshops in El Salvador. Textile plants in Georgia, in Alabama. Gone to El Salvador. Why? $8, $10 labor here. $1.75 labor in El Salvador. 
So we, these poor El Salvadorians are working in sweatshops. Viva la sweatshop! <laughs> it's the way the world works. Resources are moving to take advantage of, in this case, it's moving from one kind of labor to another. Or it's moving locationally, but it could be from moving from labor to machine. So when you get labor unions... Uh, in you always see employment fall when labor unions come in, or nearly always. And very often, one way that entrepreneurs deal with labor unions is they put in more machines because they're cheaper and they don't unionize. <laughs> okay. Point five. We've got to keep moving this thing along here. I'm running a tight ship. Uh, This is a fairly long uh, quote. I'll have to, uh, the labor market is actuated by entrepreneurs' intent upon making profits. Each entrepreneur is eager to buy all the kinds of specific labor he needs for the realization of his plans at the cheapest price. The upper limit of his bidding is determined by anticipation of the price he can obtain for the increment in sellable goods he expects from the employment of the worker concerned. The lower limit is determined by the bids of competing entrepreneurs who themselves are guided by analogous considerations. I'll, I'll finish the quote and then comment on it a little bit. There will be people eager to take advantage of the margin between the prevailing wage rate and the marginal product of labor. Their demand for labor will bring wage rates back to the height conditioned by labor's marginal productivity. Wages are determined by marginal product. There are several things in this quote, though, that need to be discussed. That In my earlier quick uh, example, we glossed over, and this brings out. The first thing is uh, a word that, that I, I did hint at. Each eager is, uh, you know, is that the upper limit of his bidding, the employer's bidding, is determined by the anticipation of the price he can obtain for the increment in sellable goods. Uh, employers anticipate, they forecast, they make a judgment about. What kind of income am I going to receive by adding this worker? And that judgment is not infallible. The, where mistakes are made. The, first of all, there can be a mistake made about the quality of the worker. The second mistake can be misjudging the price that will be received in the future for the sale of the commodity. Mises says you cannot predict future prices based on la uh, next year's price or tomorrow's price based on yesterday's price. At most, it's just a rough and ready guide that helps you in making your own forecast, but it is not an exact predictor. You cannot predict this with certainty. Therefore, there is some uncertainty and there are mistakes made. Where mistakes are made, adjustments are made. Suppose the wicker baskets, Britney Spears doesn't have quite the impact we all thought she would have on the basket market. And we end up with a bunch of baskets we can't sell, so we cut the price of baskets. And so as we further, should we continue to hire this worker, uh, she may not be worth continuing to hire because we're not getting as much money for the basket as we anticipated. And she's not covering her marginal cost. The lower limit is determined by the bids of competing entrepreneurs who are themselves guided by analogous consideration. I go out and hire a worker and I make, quote, a profit off that worker. Let's say I'm paying her $100 and she's adding 125 to my marginal product, which is roughly what happened in that example. Well, someone else... Dr. Thornton will come all open and all, uh, open Thornton baskets. And, and Mark, being smart as he is, will go to my workers and say, why don't you come to work for me? I'll pay you 110. Better only pays 100. He's, he runs a sweatshop. 
I, I, I run a, 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 I'm a humane employer. I'll pay you 110. Still hoping to get the 125 in marginal product. Still hoping to make a profit. And then uh, 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 Shane here. Shane here. Open Shane's baskets and offers 120 to Thornton's employees. Dr. Thornton's employees. Still making a little money. So the wage will be bid up to it approximates the marginal product. So the determinant of wages is the marginal product. Now, I wish because of time, I'm not going to get into some interesting problems. And in Mises, there's very little Mises doesn't anticipate. He talks about all this. Labor unions and so on. Uh, licensing laws uh, that make it uh, you know, difficult for people to move from A to B. Uh, there are all kinds of institutional obstacles that keep in the real world where we ha don't have the unhampered market economy that, that sometimes interferes with this and causes problems. And we'll come to a couple of those. Let's start talking about some of those. In fact, let's talk about uh, them now. Let's, are we up to six? Okay. What causes unemployment is the fact that those eager to earn wages can and do wait. A job seeker who does not want to wait will always get a job in the unhampered market economy. I repeat, a job seeker who does not want to wait will always get a job in the unhampered market economy. It is only necessary for him either to reduce the amount of pay he is asking for or to alter his occupation or his place of work. You can always get a job. You may have to lower your wage request. You may have to work somewhere else. But you can get a job. In the unhampered market economy. Not this economy. In the unhampered market economy. He chooses between employment and unemployment in the same way in which he proceeds in all other actions and choices. He weighs pros and cons. Now, there is a model, a, a way economists can do this, and I've seen my representatives in the European Union. This place is, is we're, we're, one way to say we're blessed by large participation from Europe. Another way is we could put it as we're infested by the EU. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I promised the EU people I would get something in on the EU before I, I left. I am thoroughly annoyed at the EU. Uh, this is the duration of unemployment. The number of weeks a worker is without work. This is a, a graph that's very much in the, uh, the tradition of Mises. Uh, and uh, here is, uh, say, the wage rate. A worker is contemplating well, wants a job. And uh, workers have what economists sometimes call reservation wages. That is, the minimum wage that a worker is willing to accept. If a worker gets that wage or a higher wage, she will go to work. If, if the worker gets a lower wage than the reservation wage, she will not go to work. So this is the reservation wage. This is definition of a reservation wage. The minimum acceptable wage. Let's say you have suddenly uh, graduated from college and you're looking for your first job. You start out saying, oh, I won't work for less than $100,000 a year. Because I am so cool. <laughs> and uh, six months later, you were willing to work for 50000 <laughs> Another six months later, you'll work for $1.25 an hour. <laughs> so, the, the, the reservation weight tends to fall over time. The longer you're out of work, the, the more desperate you get, if you like. Uh, at the same time, the best job offer you're likely to receive uh, will improve over time. Because you, you take, it takes a little time to, to look around, get jobs, to search the Internet, to call people, to go for interviews and so forth. Presuming up to a point your offer will get better. At some point it may level off and actually not go up because you've been out of work so long no one will want to hire you. So anyway, when do you go to work? You go to work when your uh, best offer equals or exceeds your reservation wage. Now, so when people are out of work, 
uh, it's simply, it's voluntary. They're out of work because they want to be out of work. You could always go to McDonald's and get a job. McDonald's is the employer of last resort <laughs> in America. People used to talk about government. Well, you don't need government. We have McDonald's. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so this is what happens. Now, what makes Europe different than the U.S.? What is the average duration of unemployment in the U.S.? Does anyone know? About 15 weeks, usually. It's, it's up a little right now. What is it in Germany? About 50 weeks, 60 weeks, 70 weeks. Why? Because reservation wages are so much higher in Europe than in the U.S. So the average worker, so that curve crosses the uh, best offer much later in time. People sit out more. Why, are, why is the reservation higher in Europe? The welfare state. I don't need to get a job. I can sit home and watch the German equivalent of Oprah, whatever that is, <laughs> uh, and make uh, you know a decent living. And so and in France and uh, Italy, we have them all represented here. Countries, France unemployment rates 9%, America's 4.5%. Double French. You take the American unemployment, you double it, you got the French unemployment. The French sit around more. Uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. All right, you're laughing. Where's Italy? Where's Bologna? Okay, there's Bologna. I want it. This is a fact. Fact. In America, over the age of 16, 64 percent of Americans work. <laughs> Italy, 48 percent. That's, that's this is statistically. This is a fact. For every four Americans working, for any hundred people, there are three Italians working. The fourth is watching something. <laughs> They're going to see the movie Gladiator. Uh, uh, took place in Italy in its glory days. Uh, okay. So this gets unemployment in the unhappy. Uh, we're still... Uh, uh, have I, how many points I've given you? Six. The point I'm making here is unemployment in the unhampered market economy is always voluntary. People, we may call it on a, this government statisticians may measure unemployment in the unhampered market economy. Unemployment, the only unemployment is voluntary unemployment. People who choose to be unemployment. And that must, now, now let's go to point seven. That must not be confused with institutional unemployment. Institutional unemployment is not the outcome of the decision of individual job seekers. It is the effect of the interference with the market phenomena intent upon enforcing by coercion and compulsion wage rates higher than those the unhampered market would have determined. And so you get wage rates that are artificial, either minimum wage laws, Welfare systems that lead to uh, people changing their human action, not because of their individual tastes and preferences, but because of these institutional factors that lead to this sort of uh, high unemployment uh, duration. Okay, I, was that seven? Okay, I've got to speak faster. I had a, the Ohio legislature called me on the carpet once. They called me in. They pass a law saying professors have to teach 10% more. Their teaching load has to go up by 10%. I was testifying before the Ohio legislature and the senator asked me, Professor Vetter, how are you meet meeting the new teaching law requirement? Did you have to teach 10% higher teaching loads? I said, Senator, I speak 10% faster than I used to. <laughs> I did that too. I, I really did that. By the way, I'm still teaching and the senator is no longer there. Okay, number eight. In weighing the pros and cons of the hiring of workers, the employer does not ask himself what the worker gets as take-home wages. The only relevant question for him is, what is the total price I have to expend in securing the services of this worker? If laws or business customs force the employer to make other expenditures besides the wages he pays to the employee, the take-home wages are reduced accordingly. 
Such accessory expenditures do not affect the gross rate of wages. Their incident falls upon the wage earner. So, the government says the employer must pay health care benefits to the workers. And in some states, they, they, now they're saying, you know, putting all these things you've got to offer with insurance. This is, the Europeans are in a different system, which is even worse perhaps, but ours is bad uh, because of our government interference in this market. But, you know, uh, in some states they have to provide contraceptives, you know. Uh, one of those things that you only buy once every seven years, you know, then it <laughs> has nothing, it's not a routine expenditure of life. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, you got to offer, uh, I don't know, this benefit of that. Anytime that you impose a cost on an employer that that is related to the hiring of the worker, it... It, it increases the marginal cost of labor. And the only way you can continue to hire the same number of workers as you were before is to simply lower the wage. So less of the compensation of the worker is in the form of wages and more of it is in the form of these government-mandated so-called benefits that the workers didn't ask for, but the government, by coercion, provided. There are no free lunches or breakfasts or dinners or even pizzas at Mr. Gaddy's in the world. Uh, uh, and keep that always in mind. Number nine, it has sometimes happened uh, that the policies applied in poor relief have encouraged unwillingness to work and the idleness of able-bodied adults. In other words, welfare state. Mises anticipated France's 9% unemployment, Germany's high unemployment, Italy's, Always high unemployment. Uh, is Spain here? Unemployment rates in Spain have traditionally been three to four, twice, at least twice those of Portugal. Spain has the highest unemployment rates. Are they still true? Awfully high unemployment rates in Spain. Spain has insane, absolutely insane labor laws. You can't fire a worker in Spain. It's like a country where everyone has tenure. <laughs> and, and as a consequence, they have extremely high unemployment. And it's uh, it because, and also in France and all the welfare state working like that. Ten, point ten: If the capitalist uh, society in the capitalist society there prevails a tendency towards a steady increase in the per capita quota of capital invested, the accumulation of capital soars above the increase in population figures. Consequently, the marginal productivity of labor, real wage rates, and the wage earner's standard of living tends to rise continuously. That's the American experience. That, to a large extent, is the European experience. It is not the experience in Zimbabwe. Why is Zimbabwe not growing over time and America is? Because in America we allow capital formation. We don't uh, confiscate capital. We allow people to form capital. So the Austrian emphasis on capital is Dr. Garrison. Wait till you get Dr. Garrison. He thinks the only thing in the world is capital, you know. Uh, there's capital and there's food and there's sex and then nothing else. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, but he has a point. He has a point. Okay. I'm sure that'll get back to him, won't it? I better tell him, uh, preempt you on that one. Number 11. Are we on 11? We skip 10? We're on 11? Okay, we're about out of time, so that's good. Whenever, a, and this is really a small one I just threw in as a bonus, I wanted to outdo the Lord. Uh, whenever an employer asks for special performances which appear irksome or repulsive to the employees, he must pay extra for the excess of disutility the worker must expend. This is what in economics is called the concept of uh, compensating differentials sometimes. If you're asked to do dirty work, work you don't like, you, you get paid more. More than a person with comparable experience. For example, workers on oil drilling platforms in Alaska or the North Sea make good money, far more money than most people with the same degree of education, experience, or talent because it's dangerous work because now and then a wind comes along and blows workers into the North Sea. And so there's danger associated with it. And, th and this is the price. 
Now, what is the common theme going through all this? Human action works very well in labor markets. Uh, human markets work very well in labor markets. Markets are reasonably efficient. Markets are more efficient than any alternative. And interferences in labor market are the cause of most of the problem, all of the problems. Strike most, substitute all, A-L-L, <laughs> of the problems that we, ha that we have. High unemployment, uh, people unable to get jobs.